If you are here for Jesus, the miracle worker, you are in the right place. <laughs> um, let me say, first of all, uh, before we get going, and I, I get lost because I get excited, um, I want to thank all of you for the uh, eight years of uh, faithfulness that you have given to me in terms of participation in these classes. Uh, knowing each time I was teaching that I, I would be having a group, seriously, who I knew were deep in the faith and they were hungry for the Word of God and they wanted to know its application, uh, it always challenged me to work harder, to do it better, to not, not just do something simple and easy, but to, to get deep into the Word of God and say, what's the meaning here and how does this apply to our lives? And you have been very responsive, and I appreciate that. And so your enthusiasm uh, and your commitment, as evidence again uh, tonight, uh, has been a stimulus to me and a blessing to me at the same time. So I thank you from my heart. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'm excited about this class as well, but as those of you who have been in other classes will say, eh, every class he gets excited, so there's nothing different about that. Um, but I, I picked up a book several months ago, it's just down here, Jesus the Miracle Worker, and uh, it's one of the best things I had read in the last four or five years. And I said, I've got to teach this, this stuff is really good, and uh, it's exciting, because as you'll see, the questions that are raised uh, when we look at the miracles of Jesus and how we can answer, defend, and speak to the credibility and the authenticity of the miracles. And that's uh, important in the time in which we are living it and the culture in which we are living, which I'll explain in more detail later. So I think you will find uh, this to be very uh, challenging at times, not in terms of intellectual challenge, but say, what do I really believe about some of these stories, and how did this take place? And why, in fact, when you look at the Gospels, you may see that uh, the same miracle is told in different Gospels, and somehow they say some different things at times. Why the differences? Are these contradictions? Does this discredit the authenticity or the credibility of the story? Because they're different, these questions we're going to look at. Uh, because, frankly, a lot of the criticism which is directed at the Christian faith, particularly the Gospels, since we're being primarily looking at the Gospels, is oftentimes very shallow attacks, which I'll even show you tonight, uh, some of it, uh, and we, we send our young people off to a college. We have a college professor here, and we, we send them, and I know Evelyn doesn't do this, but uh, we send them off to uh, colleges. It can also be not just secular colleges, but Christian colleges, and their faith comes under attack, uh, and they're told things about the Bible that they're, they're totally unprepared to respond to, to answer, and they come home and think that the Bible doesn't have any credibility. And uh, I'm here to inform you, the Bible has great credibility, and I'll show that to you uh, in these accounts as we look at the miracles of Jesus Christ, which is a major issue. Well, miracles in the Bible is a major issue when we come into a scientific, empir empirically based society, age that we live in. Uh, miracles seem to be outside the norm, and so we're going to be looking at that. Now, uh, we're going to have a word of prayer, and then we're going to uh, look at how we're going to do the class, okay? And uh, does everybody have uh, the materials in the booklet? Okay, you want to make sure everybody has it. Uh, tonight you didn't get any color pictures, and some of you will go home and say, oh, where's our colored photos? <laughs> but beginning next week when we look at uh, in detail some miracles, then from each miracle I'll give you a picture, because generally you can find something on the internet of each uh, miracle that Jesus performed. But we're going to be looking at the broader issue today of miracles and uh, their credibility and how do we examine them. So let's pray for us, shall we? Lord, we thank you for this time to come together to study uh, your word, the word of God that brings truth and light and 
strengthens our faith. So we'd ask that you would uh, be our teacher tonight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, I've given to you on the uh, page after the class outline. Well, let's, let's go through the class outline first, okay? So you can see. Tonight, we're, we're going to be touching a, a couple of Jesus' miracles to, for illustration purposes. Beginning next week, we start to examine the, the miracles in detail. Today, we look at certain basic questions which lay the foundation for our discussion and our examination of the miracles themselves. The questions that are asked about the credibility and how, what do we know, how can we know it is true about these miracles. Okay? And so we're going to uh, look at the general question of why do we study Jesus' miracles? Because most of us, if I ask the question, why do we study the miracles? Bill Fader, uh, elder that he is, would raise his hand and he would say, because it's in the Bible and I believe the Bible. Amen. Amen. See? <laughs> Nothing more needs to be said. Uh, and that, by the way, will satisfy a lot of Christians. But I want to understand it. Okay, good, Nancy. I want to understand it. I want to understand why is that miracle being testified to? Because the Gospels also tell us, the Gospel John, Jesus did many other miracles which are not recorded. Why are these selected? Why do they seem to be, as you study the Gospels comparatively, they sometimes are in different places in the, in the, the story of Jesus. So what are the authors of the Gospels trying to do? Why, when we look at a particular story, uh, one of one, which I dealt with last Sunday uh, in the sermon, the uh, demoniac of the Gerasenes in Luke 9. It's also in uh, Mark 8, Mark 5, Mark 5 or 6. Um, and it's told a little bit differently. Why? Did somebody get the story wrong? Is this just a make-believe story? That goes to the next question. Some people will argue, and some of them will call themselves, which they are, uh, New Testament scholars, which means they have studied the Bible at some university and received a doctor's degree in uh, you know, New Testament studies. And they, they may be of the position that the stories in the Bible are later additions or stories that were brought together after Jesus' death that were made up. Sometimes they'll make the accusation that the stories were taken from other religion and cultures. And then they're given identity of Jesus. For instance, one that probably most of you are aware of. The idea of a child being born of a virgin was not unique to Christianity. Other religions had that. And so the accusation has been made that the Christian faith incorporates or takes that and puts it into the uh, its, its uh, stories about Jesus. And, you, and yet they will make an argument, which I think lacks all of that validity, they say, why is it not the virgin birth in Mark and John? It's in Matthew and Luke, but it's not in the other two. And so you know, I get all these questions that are, are, are asked. And so uh, we say, why do we study? Because if we can show that the stories, particularly the miracles, have validity, then we want people to, to understand that, that they can trust the Bible. Secondly, we're going to look at the objectives of the class, and uh, you, you're going to see what they're about. We're going to go to ask the question, which will begin this third point, with the question, what is a miracle? And I want you to think about that, because frankly, I'm going to offer you six of the possible set eight or nine definitions of a miracle that are out there. Okay? And uh, so be thinking, in your, because you're going to have to answer, because if you, nobody gives an answer, we stop, we close our books, we start to pray. <laughs> <laughs> Until somebody gives an answer, what is a miracle? Because I want, I'm already acknowledging, there's different definitions of what a miracle is. And so we'll, we'll look at that, 
and then we get beyond uh, what is a miracle. Then we start to delve into the questions, are the miracle stories reliable? And what we'll do tonight is look at how do you determine whether they're reliable? Then when we actually look at the miracles themselves, I'll show you the indicators in the stories that tell us about the reliability, the credibility of what's been written there. And, and then we'll ask, uh, deal with the, the questions like, do miracles actually happen and do they happen today? So the, these are the, the, the foundation that we're laying tonight because once we lay that foundation, then we can go looking at the miracle stories in particular and answer these questions that, that we learned at tonight. Now, the way we're then going to do it the following weeks, and next week we're going to go into the exorcisms of Jesus. Interestingly enough, while we don't like to preach about exorcisms, because we don't like to talk about demons or think about demons, Jesus has five exorcism stories, events. Oh, it must have been something significant to Jesus and the Gospel writers that they put it five different accounts of exorcism. Now, we don't want to run around uh, O'Fallon and St. Charles looking for <laughs> demons. <laughs> but, Jesus thought it was significant, and the Gospel writers deemed it significant. What, what was so important about Jesus exercising people? I picked that one first because I'd just done a sermon on it, and so it made it easy, but we're not going to be looking at that story. Uh, your assignment, if you look at the last page, your assignment for next week. Uh, why is my last page not ahead? Very yeah, yeah it, it says read. Yeah, uh, It's just the Gospel of Mark. There are four exorcism stories there. And so I, you will be, be much better prepared for the material. We go faster if you have some familiarity because I'll be comparing them and saying what's going on here. Um, and then the next week we're going to look at crippled and paralytics. And what I'm going to do, you can see each week, there's different types of uh, miracles he performs. Then he heals the blind. That's a whole category in itself. And, and I'll just share with you why. Because normally you'd say, well, isn't that just another healing? No, there's... The Bible wants us to see something particular about healing the paralytics, which is important, the cripple. And then something unique about healing the blind, which is important. And I'll give you a hint. If you go in the Old Testament and you look carefully and it says the Messiah, and sometimes it calls the Son of Man or some will heal the blind. These things are in the Old Testament that the Messiah is going to do. So the Gospel writers are putting those stories in to show something particular. He is the Messiah. He's doing the miracles that were prophesied in the Old Testament. We're raising the dead. This is not his own resurrection. There are three uh, instances where he raises the dead. Lepers are cleansed. That's a very important event as well when he's dealing with lepers. Uh, then there's other various healings we'll address. And then nature miracles. And then we'll look at uh, the importance of November 1st, Jesus, the miracle worker, uh, then the meaning of his miracles, and then I left November 15 open, not for the final test, which <laughs> last, last people miserably fail. <laughs> so, those of you who you know, don't want to be disappointed, don't show up on the 15th. No, uh, really, I left it open because what happens, I tend to be long-winded, and you never get to all the material. So I said, I'll give myself some more time here at the end. Uh, so on the weeks for September 20th through October 25th, uh, where we have various categories of miracles, if you, any, any of you in particular, say, hey, I'd really like you to focus on uh, this particular miracle. I've given you the, the listing of the miracles. I haven't always... Uh, put it in where the comparative one may be in Luke as well as in Matthew, but I've always given one of the instances of, of that miracle, uh, one of the citations of that miracle. If you want me to do that particular miracle, uh, because what we're going to find once we start getting into them, it really takes half hour, even longer, to go through one miracle and what it means. So if you want me to go through one, uh, because 
it's always troubled you, or you say, what, what does this mean? Uh, uh, for instance, uh, the nature miracles. Why does he curse a fig tree and it dies? That's a miracle. Why did he do that? Seems like a cool thing to do. That's what he did. So you, you have some input into it. The next page, of course, you have uh, a listing of the miracles, what gospels they're in, and what type of miracle they are. So now we are on, it says, objectives and issues concerning Jesus' miracles. Let's see if I can move it in here. Oh, yeah, we get to, you can have that up here. Why study, why study Jesus' miracles? I give it a little bit of an outline here, but I want to be more specific. Can I ask a question? Yes, sir, Jim. Uh, in Israel, they told us that the miracle uh, at the wedding of Cana was the first of Jesus' miracles, but he's number 31 in your list. So, uh, the, the list. First of all, the list isn't my list. Oh. I, I took it off the internet. Oh. Um, and yeah, uh, that is the, the first one in the Gospel of John. It's generally conceded by scholars that that's the first one. But if you go in, which is important, we'll get to that. Why does John? The only one who gives us that miracle. Okay? Why does John, which leads to the question, why does John see that as an important miracle? Because remember, uh, when he's asked uh, by his, his, his mother says to him, oh, they say, uh, there's no more wine. Well, what's his answer? Did anybody remember? Woman, why are you bothering me? It's not my time. Like, you know, back off, old lady. But that's not what he's saying, by the way. Didn't he? Um, but why does John pick that out to do the first miracle? Ah, there's a purpose. Okay. Why does Mark, what's the first miracle in the Gospel of Mark? He heals Peter's mother in law's fever. Why is that the first miracle? Remember, these gospel writers, as the gospel writers and writers of that time did, wrote specifically. One of the things you're going to hear repeatedly is that when the gospel writers wrote, they are using a format that was common at that time. That format being the actions of a person tell us a great deal about the person. What we see or here, in particular, in American society today, is a person does something, and all the commentators tell us what their what their motives are. I mean, don't we all get a little bit sick? Uh, when, I don't care who, which president it is. Okay, but President Trump does something. It could have been President Obama, and you go to the all different stations, 24 hours of news, and then all these commentators who you don't know where they got their information now tell you the motives. Well, really, these people are incredible. They, can, they, they know the motives of, of these. Uh, they, well, they didn't do that in biblical times. When that, that, that their style of writing was... They would uh, tell us stories about the person because they believe the stories and the action tell you the character of the person. Now, that's important because that means when the gospel writers put these stories in there, and they tell us what the person did. They want us to know something about that person's character. So we're always looking for that. That becomes the major question in when you, you look at the four Gospels, because what is the focus of all four Gospels? What do they all lead to? What do they climax for? The crucifixion and the resurrection, right? All four do that, and that becomes the main theme in each of the four Gospels. How can it be that we can define Christianity without putting the emphasis or the center on the cross and the resurrection? That's what the original people spoke about. So if we hear even today people who are in Christian churches and they say, I don't believe in the resurrection. Okay? I remember back in 1975, when I was in uh, Presbytery in Pennsylvania, and I heard, oh, sorry, New York, 
and I heard after Easter that one of the pastors at a church, Presbyterian church in the Presbytery, uh, had delivered a sermon that was then passed around the Presbytery that he said he did not believe Jesus rose from the dead. Easter Sunday sermon. Now that was a big deal in 1975 in the Presbytery. That would not even cause a stir today in most Presbyteries. Okay? And so you can see how we're changing. But my question that I'm relating it to is if, if the Gospel writers are making the cross and the resurrection the main point of the story, and their writing style is that to indicate that the actions of the person tell us who this person is more than anything else, how can you take those two elements out of the stories? seems to be the center. Okay. So each of these miracles had needs. That's what I'm getting at. So we're going to start here. Why study the miracles? First of all, the miracles of Jesus are regularly in the news. Uh, about 1994, there has been a, a lot of uh, refutation, criticism, questioning of the miracles of Jesus Christ in the American media. It's a reflective of the fact that the, the whole uh, doubt about the credibility of Christianity continues to grow in our society. <clears throat> but in part, it's fed by those who, who pardon me, label themselves as Christian scholars. Uh, I'm not saying they're not uh, Christian scholars. I need something to drink. I need a miracle is what I need. <laughs> Okay. They're Christian scholars in the sense that they study Christianity and they are scholars in Christianity. As uh, I, I studied in England with uh, a, a famous Christian theologian, J.I. Packer. Packer writes in, a, in his book, Knowing God, uh, in the first chapter. He said he remembered uh, Packer studying at uh, Oxford. And he said that he remembered walking uh, along with his uh, tutor, the, the one who guided him through his doctoral studies at Oxford. And the, the tutor said to him, you know, just because somebody writes about Christianity does not mean they believe it. And uh, so somebody today can call themselves a Christian scholar and that they are, but that doesn't mean that they believe in the faith. Okay? Uh, and so, what we see is a lot of media attention to this question about Jesus uh, and the miracles that he performed. Some of this has been caused by what is called the Jesus Seminar. This is a group of about 200 Christian scholars, and I've defined Christian scholars for you. The Christian scholars who uh, believe, and they publicize this stuff regularly. There's a lot of books. I have several of them. That eighty percent of the statements attributed to Jesus in the Gospel are, by voting consensus, either gray or black. Well, what does that mean? They take a vote on everything in the Bible, and they say, uh, if it's red, Jesus. Or, that's supposed to be red, and it's supposed to be orange. Uh, Jesus did say this, or something like it. They say. They, they have concluded the Jesus Seminar, and they, or their stuff's published all the time. Okay? It's been in Time Magazine and Covers of Time and Newsweek and others. And uh, they, they concluded when they did the Gospel of Mark, there's only one original saying in the Gospel of Mark by Jesus. That saying is, Jesus said, give unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, and unto God the things that are God's. Everything else in the Gospel they don't believe Jesus said. So how do they do that? They get together and they have colored balls. They say, how many people believe? And they throw it in. So if it gets more red balls, they say it is that. And then these people study it. It's just not, let's you know, have a couple of beers and decide whether Jesus says <laughs> So then this is supposed to be a pink and this is gray and black. Black is Jesus never said this or anything like it. So that's how they conclude uh, Jesus. So they have said that 80% of the statements in the Gospels that either gray or black, meaning not likely or he didn't say it at all. Now what I'm going to show you 
in this class is when you look at some of these things, I'm not, we're not looking so much at the sayings of Jesus, but we're looking at the miracles. You can put a lot of confidence in what has been done, said in these miracles, in the Bible, in these miracles. Secondly, that Jesus sent our people, uh, said, Jesus did not say, blessed are the poor, but rather, congratulations, you're poor. I mean, how in the world do you get to that conclusion? I, I, I don't want to be cynical, I just don't. Uh, I know how you do it. You, your work, language, and the academics to do it, but it's twisting the whole thing. And it's saying that the, each of the gospel writers who say that, and you have it both in Luke and you have it in Matthew, both of them are, are deliberately misconstruing what Jesus said. And so once you lay that doubt, you start to discredit everything else in the, in the gospel. Now this kind of thing is being uh, fed to our young people and our Christian young people. Less than 20% of Jesus' statement in the New Testament are probably uh, uh, originating again. So they're simply saying, not much in the New Testament is said by Jesus. One of the other problems that you probably uh, are not aware of when we come to the miracles of Jesus is how much does Paul talk about the miracles of Jesus? Not much at all. He talks about the resurrection. He focuses on the cross constantly. He does make one or two references to the miracles, or he calls it the signs and the powers that he demonstrates. So he's acknowledging, but he doesn't go into the miracles themselves. Why? Well, we'll answer that later on. I think there's a, a good reason for it. And it's not that he doesn't believe in it. He's not focusing on it. Uh, Second thing why we study is the Gospels portray Jesus as spending a large proportion of his time not only teaching but performing miracles. Now this is interesting, and I'll tell you who, the, who in part created this problem. We fo focus more on what Jesus said than on what Jesus did. We do focus on the cross and the resurrection, but we particularly in the Protestant faith put the miracles aside. There's two reasons for that. Number one, as those of you who took the class on Presbyterianism remember, that when the whole liberal and conservative debate took place in the Presbyterian Church, which was also taking place in other Protestant churches in America, and the whole idea of uh, the scientific method now coming into the fore the latter part of the 19th century, now the questions of the validity of miracles was being raised. Criticism, what they called, you remember I used the term, higher criticism of the Bible, was raising doubts about the validity of what was being said in the Bible. Vis-a-vis, -vis, the church became a little more reluctant to talk about the miracles. Because there were all kind of questions. Did these things really take place? Really, how do you heal a blind person? Nancy, I'm not being facetious. I don't know. Let me know. No, I, said that, I honestly said that because she was here for and we all love her. I said, gee, if Jesus was here, one of the first things we'd ask is, Jesus, heal that woman. She loves you. Okay? So, but we said, ah, I don't think that's going to happen. In fact, if I said, hey, let's all gather around Nancy and pray for healing. I think most of you would say, yeah, I'll be glad to do that. And then you'd walk away and say, I don't think anything's going to happen. Because we have our doubts. Okay? So we don't talk about the miracles much. And the, the, the scientific mood of our society diminishes the, the miracles. And yet, that's exactly the opposite of the gospel writers. They put a great deal of emphasis upon these miracles. Because it's telling us something about Jesus. And they wanted, And then a lot of the uh, uh, scholars who I respect say, there's no indication in the New Testament that Jesus was a dynamic speaker. What attracted the people to come to hear Jesus? The miracles. He did a miracle. They listened. And so he used, part of what we'll see is, he used miracles as demonstration of the power of God so that he could then convey to people how did you get the power of God. And by the way, some people come looking for that power. You see that in the Acts of the Apostles. We also see some coming to Jesus wanting to know, how, where do you get this power? And of course, what do the scribes and Pharisees say about this power? Anybody? It's come from Satan. Only Satan can do what you're doing. So, uh, 
The second point there is that a large proportion of Jesus' gospel stories is about him healing the sick and casting out demons and doing these miracles. So we better understand what is its place in the New Testament. Then it will lead us to the further question, what is the place of miracles in our faith and in the church today? You know, miracles are happening in other places uh, around the world. We'll talk about that later on. Uh, I've already made point number three about ancient biographical writings. That's an important part of explaining. So, uh, we go. let's look at the objectives of the class. We're going to discover how the gospel writers understood the miracles. We're going to see why some of them wrote the, the, some things about the miracles and put made that emphasis, others put other emphasis from the same miracle, they would say some different things. Uh, we're going to see that sometimes the miracles are placed in different order in the life of Jesus, because we tend to think, as we read books, uh, that even the Gospels, thinking we think of them as each a separate uh, chronological account. They're not chronological accounts. They're not trying to say on day one, year one, year two, year three, up. You know, we, we get him up to a little boy in the temple, then we get him again when he's uh, you know, 30 years old. And now we can go, go each day or each month of his life, 30, month one, month two. That's not how the Gospels are written at all. And that's why it can cause confusion. And it also uh, helps us understand why they put the stories in different places. Because they're trying to emphasize certain characteristics or truths about Jesus. And we particularly see that in the Gospel of John where you'll see uh, a miracle and then Jesus teaches. A miracle and Jesus teaches. Uh, and so what we want to discover is what the gospel writers understood the miracles to mean. Because sometimes we project our meaning into the miracles. First of all, we understand what did they think that miracle meant. Secondly, we ask, how did Jesus understand his miracles? Why did he do miracles? Was it simply a crowd catcher? No, it wasn't. Okay. He did it for a very specific purpose. But let's look at another question. How did he understand his miracles? How is it? Oh, well, let me ask you this. When it comes to healing uh, people, what was Jesus' method for healing? Okay, I'll ask some questions. Sometimes he asks them a question first. Yeah, okay, sometimes. But sometimes uh, people are healed and he's not even near them, right? Right. Okay. Sometimes, remember the woman, the lady? Sometimes he doesn't even know it until she touches him and the power goes out of him and he knows who touched him. Some Does he have to say, here's some question. Does he have to say anything to make a miracle happen? No. no. Miracles occur without him saying anything. Sometimes he said, be healed. To the paralytic, he says, get up and walk. Another story of the paralytic, he says, your sins are forgiven. Walk. Walk. What's going on here? Other times, he heals. He, he tries to heal a blind man. He touches him and says, be healed. And what happens? He's not healed. What's he do? He picks up some dirt, spits in it, puts it on his eye. Why? Does the dirt have the healing power? No, the spit. What's going on? Yeah, the spit. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I like those in Darden who sit close in the front row on my side because you get you're, you're in my spitting room. <laughs> but I've noticed that, that first three rows on my side, nobody sits in there. <laughs> I'm telling you, there's a healing power if I spit. <laughs> no, sure. But that's a question. Oh, what? There is no method. Sometimes he prays, Father, do this. Sometimes he, he, he says, go, she's healed. To Jairus' daughter, go, she's healed. He doesn't have a method. So what's going on here? What does he think the healings mean? Why does he use different methods? To do it. The gospel writers show us this. And that's what you're going to discover. Continuing on, uh, 
Did he expect his followers to perform miracles? Anybody? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Many times he says to go and do this. Here's an interesting question about the miracles of Jesus. There's one, I'm not, I'm not going to remember which gospel, it's not, not John. He sends out the disciples to go do miracles. Okay? He sends them out two by two and says, I think it's Matthew, go preach the gospel and do miracles. They come back and they say to him, Lord, we could not cast out a demon, but this man, this other man, was able to do it. It's called the, the unnamed uh, healer. That's the next gospel man. What's going on there? He sends his own out. They can't heal, but they find somebody else who could heal. What does Jesus say? Anybody remember? He said, he who is not for... Uh, who is not against me, is for me. He acknowledges this unnamed healer. He must be saying, this guy's using the power of God to do what he's doing. But he had sent his own out. And then he says, greater things than I have done, you will do. What does that mean? We're going to be greater preachers? Uh, he's talking about miracles. Is he talking about just resurrection? That's how sometimes we preachers try to get around that difficult text. He's talking about just as he rose from the dead, the greater thing you will do is you will rise from the dead. Well, that's good. I'm thankful for that. I think he's saying more than that. That he's expecting his church to perform. So, that leads to the question, are miracles still part of the church today? Thirdly, uh, to what extent do the gospel miracles reflect what actually happened? That is the core of many of each, each time you look at a miracle, we'll look at what actually happened. Uh, because then we'll uh, respond each time to the accusations of those who say uh, this story is fabricated because of A, B, and C in the story. And I'll show you that yeah, you can make that accusation, admittedly, but there are other things that seem to refute that this is a fabrication. And what you get in, so you're all aware, uh, and, and no one's disappointed or surprised. You weigh the evidence. You all become judges, and you say, does the evidence seem to indicate this is valid, or does the evidence seem to indicate it's not valid? I think for about 85% of them that will, uh, of the, this gospel, we won't look at all the gospel miracles, show a great high degree of validity. About 15%, we can say, it's pretty, it's uncertain. I'm not saying it didn't happen. I'm simply saying it's hard to prove logically and with the evidence in the text that that actually happened. The others, you can give us evidence that shows it happened. We move on to what else? What is a miracle? Now, now comes the, your opportunity. Which, by the way, uh, I think it said that the class goes to 745. I think I was in Hawaii when somebody made that up because the class goes to 730. <laughs> And everybody says, amen to that, it's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a it really is a miracle. <laughs> Let's talk about it. People have different opinions, and all of you have expressed this at one time or another. Or, at minimum, you've heard people express it. Oh, that's a miracle that that happened. But think about, what are we saying? Uh, and what we're going to discover, so you're aware, is that even the gospel writers have some different ideas about what constitutes a miracle. That should not surprise you, disappoint you, or cause you to lose faith. These are different people. Luke's a physician, right? They're different people who are looking at it differently, but they're all saying this is a miracle, but what they understand a miracle to be can be a little bit different, because you're going to see, even amongst us, because remember, we have to answer this question here, Otherwise, we go to prayer. <laughs> what exactly is a miracle? Uh, essential that we have in mind that the gospel, what the gospel writers do is what's important when we study the Bible. What does the gospel writer believe a miracle is? Not what do you think it is? Because we're going, the person who wrote the text is conveying the story, not you. Now, you can question the credibility of it, and that's what we'll be doing. But it's not for you to say, this is not a miracle. It's what they're saying. 
always begin with that approach to it. So, what is a miracle? Anyone? It's the feeding of the 5,000. Feeding of the 5,000, right. Okay, in, in larger context, that's an astounding event, right? I, item A in the, in the Something which astounds people or causes them to wonder, how could that happen? How can you take two loaves and five fish and feed 5,000? Okay. Uh, and that's okay. Uh, but some in, on our own day, I've heard numerous people uh, refer to watching the birth of a child. Mothers, oh, giving birth is a miracle. Uh, you're, you're watching the birth of a child. I haven't given that opportunity to give birth yet, but <laughs> I'm not looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Me doing it, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and so somebody says, that's a miracle. You know, is that, that what, you see, there's different definitions, right? It's an astounding event. Yeah, it is. But is that what we typically mean by a miracle? Well, I don't know. It's what people have said. If we move on to another. Uh, some people will say conversion is a miracle. And that, there's uh, uh, substantial support for that. Because when you read Acts of the Apostle, uh, chapter 9 of Paul's conversion, uh, Luke, the writer of the Gospel and Acts of the Apostles, is really indicating that this conversion is a miracle for what's taking, taking place in this man's life. So is conversion a miracle when you've been taken from a life of selfishness and sin and you a new life of obedience and following Jesus Christ? Yes, in that sense it is. Is it dramatic, a change of nature? No. It's a change of the human nature, but it's not the forces of nature. And so that is a broad term for a miracle as well. Others will say a, a coincidence. And I gave you an interesting story. I mean, a fictitious story. Uh, a man going down the street, uh, driving his car down the road. And while he's driving, as all of us uh, see, and I know none of us as Presbyterians participate in this activity of reading our text messages while we're driving the car. <laughs> and so this fellow happens to be reading his text message, he's driving the car, and he just happens to glance up and there's a child running out in front of him chasing the ball. So he hits his brake in time and uh, gets it. And the child is not injured. And the mother who watches this whole thing will say, oh, it's a miracle. My child is not killed. Oh, I did, right? I'm, I'm not trying to be cruel or facetious. Right? I, I would expect that state. It's a miracle. The fellow driving the car says, well, uh, really, I just happened to glance up. It had nothing to do with God. I just happened to glance up at that moment. Well, who's right? Was God at work in that event or not? I'll tell you a personal one. Uh, 1983, I was, uh, it was in January after a snowstorm in Pennsylvania. I was driving down the road, and I came, uh, I saw something laying in the road. I thought it was a deer or something. Road, just been a snowstorm. And then as I drew closer, said it's a body laying in the road. And then so I pulled my car over, went out there, and there's a lady there. And so this was before cell phones. So I had to run up to the house and uh, say, next door, and say, hey, call an ambulance. This person's in the road. And I, and I took the pulse, and I didn't get anything. I'm not a physician, so I didn't want to make an assessment. So the ambulance came, and they said, oh, she's dead. She had a heart attack. So, uh, she happened to have been uh, a very devout Catholic. And so I happened to then go to the funeral parlor just to pay my respects and introduce myself to the family. And they, they all said, what a miracle that you found her. I thought, just a coincidence, I was driving down the road. They found it to be uh, comforting. Okay, so I'm not being facetious or humorous about what they felt, and some said, and then that was a miracle that the minister, <coughs> our sister, our mother, I 
Oh, you're going for it. Okay, you see, is God working in these circumstances? We're, we're getting into this question. And how do we interpret it? Now, why, why I'm telling you the stories is because when the gospel writers are writing the story, are they looking at it in a tainted way that they would say it's a miracle, but the other person would say that's a coincidence? coincidence. Why is that important? Because when you start to look at some of the miracles, you say, how could that coincidence happen? I.e., how does a blind person coincidentally suddenly see? How is a leper suddenly healed? I love this um, so, is it coincidence? People will say that. Uh, and, and certainly, by the way, the people will make an argument I have here that, uh, this, that there are coincidences in the scriptures that uh, uh, Jesus happens at uh, the same time uh, is in the synagogue. I'm sorry. At the same, yeah, I'm sorry. I told you that the uh, Jesus healing Simon's mother-in-law was the first miracle. That's the second miracle in Mark. The first miracle is he goes into the synagogue and there's an unclean spirit in, the, in a man in the synagogue and he casts him out. That's his first miracle. So why does he pick exorcism as number one? Um, and so, is it a coincidence? Jesus happened to be in the synagogue when the unclean spirit's here. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't change the fact that Jesus healed him. And so you get into these kind of questions. Uh, a miracle can be an unexplained observable event. Uh, it's, now we're getting into the more the scientific realm. Uh, a miracle is understood as an observable event that cannot be explained by natural law or as an extraordinary event violating the laws of nature. And so we say, oh, that can only happen because God has intervened and he's changed the rules of nature. Others have responded to that by simply saying, wait a second, all we can say is are the, what are the known laws of nature? Because we are still discovering the laws of nature and how the universe operates even today. And no, no physicist, uh, astrophysicist will say, and this is not my opinion, this is what I read, they say, oh yeah, we can entirely explain the universe and uh, all the natural laws. We can't. We still won't. There's still not agreement on how did this all come into being. Generally, it's conceded the Big Bang, but what caused the Big Bang? So we don't know all the laws of nature. And so uh, sometimes the answer to miracles is that it's not a violation of the laws of nature. It is a law of nature that is, uh, we are not aware of that Jesus is able to, to work with. Uh, but what's interesting about that fact about seeing miracles as something out extraordinary out of the normal course of nature is that uh, as early we have as early back as the fifth century uh, BC the Greeks were debating miracles that their religions that, that they believed that miracles were taking place uh, and so they were saying how can they take place because the Greeks would be very mathematic and scientific they say they would see miracles and say how did that happen so religions have always been in this debate. It's not unique to Christianity. Uh, then we get into uh, others who view miracles number five as a, a, an event not the result of ordinary causes. It cannot be explained as a result of human abilities or any other force known to us. Uh, that's just uh, a general idea. Yeah, that's a miracle. You just can't explain how that happened. Then number six is interesting because this is a growing opinion. Uh, and now I will show you in this class that it doesn't apply. This uh, popular opinion is not applicable to many of Jesus' miracles. But the pill, as an explanation, is swallowed by many people. The idea is presented that what Jesus did was he had the ability as a healer to uh, understand things psychologically, psychosomatically, uh, uh, physically in ways that other people at his time didn't know or understand. And vis-a-vis uh, somebody who is paralyzed. Jesus could speak to the paralytic man, and Paul Tillich, who's uh, 
a, a Christian theologian uh, has put forth this attitude that uh, approach that Jesus could speak to the paralytic man and he realized that he had a psychological problem, that it wasn't a physical problem. And Jesus said, rise, take up your mat and walk. And he gave the man a psychological confidence to get up and walk. So it disregards it as the physical and says it's psychological. And so people try to take a lot of miracles that way. Uh, you'll see as we look at some miracles, it just doesn't apply. You may say, yes, sir. We clearly understand and acknowledge. I mean, look at me. I'm a psychological mess. And so, but here I am. <laughs> Not really. Thank goodness my wife thinks I am. But I, 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 <laughs> trust me, Jerry. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, there, there are certainly illnesses that are related to psychological. But there are none that we'll see in the gospel stories that are not psychological. So it's, it's impossible to use that argument. Uh, you have another page there, don't you? Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know why I don't. I call your page. I'll give it back to you. Okay. Are the miracle stories reliable? In the last 10 minutes. Uh, some people may say here in, in sincerity, in good faith, and with all credibility, say, look, I know they're reliable because the Bible is the inspired, authoritative word of God, and I believe in the Bible. That's enough for me. I'm not criticizing it. I'm not saying you're wrong. You're trusting in God's word. You've been convinced through multiple ways, and you have faith that this is the word of God. It's, 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 uh, I, my answer is Amen. I'm not trying to cast any doubt or aspersions about what you put to hear your faith. Okay? But I, what I'm doing is looking at it as uh, a Bible, a passionate Bible believer, and as somebody who teaches the Bible, and as somebody who has to confront people with doubts in the Bible, and how do I answer them? And that when I preach that something, I can preach it with confidence. And believe this is the Word of God. This is true. You want to you know, throw your objections. All right, let's let's have the objection. I want to hear it. I mean, and I told you, uh, I won't go into some stories of the events where I've been at, where I start to hear the objections and people start firing them at me. And I say, okay, all right. If you want to go there, let's go. Uh, I, I saw in my neighborhood yesterday. I said, you know, I was driving the car and I saw two young men. Uh, riding motorcycles, motorcycles, riding bicycles with white shirts and black ties on, <laughs> and black nap, nap tests on their back. Who are they? I commend these young men who do this. They get seven a year. years. How many years? Seven, seven years. Seven years. Like, yeah, I commend their faith and their devotion. Uh, I just get scared of them when they come to my house. <laughs> <laughs> because as my wife will say, Larry sucks them in. <laughs> I says, go ahead, do your thing. And then I say, whoa, now what about A, B, C, D? Uh, we'll come back with more. Well, no, no, that's what they always say, right, Cindy? Well, I say, how about A, B, C, D? We'll come back uh, uh, later with the answers to that. No, very never comes back. <laughs> they put an invisible X on my house. <laughs> they can say, do not come here anymore. <laughs> and I don't try to say to them, you know, I'm a minister. I just say, wait a second. It could mean this, and how about this? And what's the Greek word for that there? And where are you getting this? And, and, and they just run. trying to raise respectfully. Not trying to humiliate. Do I have to humiliate him, Cindy? No. I just say, come back, boys. Say, <laughs> Come back, man, when you have some answers. If we're going to dialogue, you want to talk, do it, let's do it. And uh, say, so I, I res respect that, I'm, but I'm going to the point here that um, I, I feel it's my obligation as a minister of the gospel to try to understand the Word of God and to deal with all the, the questions, the doubts that it raises, and to help people to see the credibility and to trust the authenticity and the authority of God's Word. So people can walk away and say, look, it's not just because I believe it, 
There's a lot of credibility to these stories in what's being said here. Um, but I also acknowledge in the second paragraph, there are devout Christians who believe the Bible, but they have difficulty believing certain things in the Bible. I'll, I'll give you some illustrations. It says in Joshua 10.13, that Joshua caused the sun to stand still. Now, scientifically and historically, uh, and I've read several articles on this, you can't prove that the sun, I mean, you can, you know, check dates on when everything has taken place and when the last time you know, these comet came by and the you other know, things are going on. And you, you go back thousands of years. And they, they can project, uh, there are two or three theories as to what star was the star that the wise men followed. And as likely as one of those two or three stars that they, they knew came by that time of the year and would have given that light at that over that area at that time. So I, res I respect that there are people who can say, well, there's no evidence scientifically or historically that the sun ever stood still other than this in the Bible. So it creates a, a doubt. I don't throw them out of the kingdom. I'm not going to say they're not Christians. I want to try to deal with that kind of issue. Other people will say, how about when Elisha throws the axe head into the water and it floats? How can that happen? Well, uh, one of the answers that some people give, and I'm not comfortable with it, uh, is that they will say, well, some miracles are fundamental to the faith. and other miracles, it doesn't make a difference whether you believe or not. Um, now, some of you may have that opinion. Uh, I'm not comfortable with, with that particular approach. Because you, now, uh, to me, you're cherry-picking out of the Bible what, what you think is convenient or acceptable. And that, that to, for me, doesn't stop because your authority now supersedes the authority of God's word. So I'm stuck with this issue, personally, not any of you. I'm stuck, personally, this is my personality, my intellect, that I want to try to find the answer. And as I've said to you, for eight and a half years, there are questions I'm going to have to the Lord in heaven that I'm not going to get answered until I get the answer. Well, how did that happen? <laughs> I could never understand that. And he's going to say, I always planned that you would never understand. Because <laughs> if you understood it all, you would be as smart as me. So I would be humbly put in my place and say, thank you, Lord. Uh, but that doesn't mean I shouldn't try, right? I should try to understand. And so, uh, because here's one of the principles of the Reformation. Since we're coming to the Reformation, 500th anniversary of the Reformation, October 29th, uh, 2017, here at Darden Presbyterian Church and around the world, by the way. It's not just Darden, we celebrate the 500th year. One of the principles of the Reformation, Reformation that the Reformers uh, insisted upon was faith seeks reason. Why did they? Meaning they wanted to understand better what God was doing and how what was being said in the Bible. Because why? Because they were being told, remember people like uh, Luther was a priest. Calvin had studied to be a priest. Many of the others had studied for the priesthood or been priests at that time. And they were told, this is what the church says, just believe it. This is what the church does, just believe it. And they saw the problems, and they saw the hypocrisy, and they saw the, the, the corruption in the church. And they said, we can't accept that. We want reason. We believe in Christ, but we don't see what you're saying to be true. So one of the principles of the Reformation was faith seeks reason. And it has always been at the foundation of the Presbyterian church, and frankly one of the reasons I realized over the years I've been a Presbyterian is the Presbyterians have always emphasized, and taught this in the Presbyterian class this summer, Presbyterians have always sought to, to be uh, students of the Bible and to be, uh, to learn and put an emphasis upon understanding. Uh, other denominations will put a greater emphasis upon emotion, passion, I'm not criticizing that. I think I need more passion. I married a woman uh, who came out of a charismatic uh, 
uh, background, and she's passionate. And I love it, her passion. She makes me, I'm going to give her credit uh, after these 30 plus years, she makes me more passionate because I watch her passion. It inspires me. Thank you. <laughs> because I can lean over this side to the intellect. Still, yeah. She said, it's the heart too, you know, Larry. <laughs> uh, last point, because when it comes up, I call that one and said, did and do miracles happen? Well, that's what we're, we're going to answer that question. Did they happen? And then we're going to answer, did it happen? Does it still happen? And what should the church be expecting? I don't have time for questions tonight. <laughs> I, I hope, seriously, that I've whet your appetite. You say, well, this is kind of a, more of an academic and an overview. Yes, it was. Because I want you to, to be able to come next week and say, ah, I read those stories. Now I, there's some questions here that I want to see. If you really want to get into it, you look at the stories, take the chart I gave you, and you say, is this story told in another gospel? Why is it a little different? So when you come next week, a lot more dialogue, participation, ask questions. That's why we won't get that many examples. I'll be prepared to do all of them, but I'll be more concerned about answering your questions about the miracles. Okay? That's right. Lord, thank you for each person here, and most of all, thank you for your spirit being present, and guiding and teaching us, and uh, reminding us that your word is true, and that most of all, you uh, are working in the world and as you work through Christ that you are working uh, through us today. So show us how we can be used in the same way. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.